Hey you guys and welcome back to my channel. So uh, today's video is going to be one that I didn't plan to make. Um, I have done and talked about ferret emergencies in the past, but I do feel it's important that I share these experiences because I think it's nice to give people kind of a full perspective of what it's like to own ferrets. I do a lot of videos that are fun. I do a lot of tutorials, a lot of with the ferrets playing and outside and being funny and being cute. But there's like a whole nother side to ferret ownership. Um, it can be stressful. It can be time consuming. It can be expensive. Uh, lots of things can happen with owning ferrets. And so I feel like if you're looking to get ferrets and all you see are all these really cute, fun, exciting videos, um, that doesn't really give you like the full picture. Uh, there are other channels that also go into the full picture. I know several other YouTubers who talk about things that are stressful or sad or expensive. So I just want to tell you kind of my experience. Um, this weekend, very unexpectedly, Weasel got sick. Now, Weasel is my million dollar baby. That's my joke, or that's what I call him. Of the five ferrets, he's the only one that has ever been to the emergency room more than one time. Actually, none of them have ever been except for him. When Weasel was a baby, he broke his leg, he broke his humerus, and he had to have a surgery that resulted in like an external pin. Last year, we had a similar situation where I thought he had had a blockage, but he didn't, he just had an upset stomach. <laughs> But because I'm a little neurotic or because I worry, um, I took him to the vet anyway, just as a precaution. Fortunately, it was a very quick visit, two hours or less. He didn't have a blockage. We went home. So Friday morning, I wake up like normal. Six o'clock, I feed the ferrets. They eat. Everything is fine. They play. Life is good. Um, I go on about my day. Dinner time comes. So I feed the ferrets um, a soup mix twice a day. So they had their soup mix in the morning and then I, you know, whatever, whatever happened during the day, our regular routine at six o'clock, I feed them their soup mix. I noticed that Weasel really doesn't want to eat, which is really abnormal for him because he's extraordinarily food driven. If he hears a bag of food or he hears me mix the soup mix, he is up under my feet until he eats. So for him to just be completely uninterested was already kind of like a sign that something wasn't right. Aside from that, he was acting kind of normal. So I make a soup mix and I put it in front of him and he walks away and I'm like, what? So I sit it in the hallway because they eat kind of like outside of their room, kind of in our hallway bathroom kind of area. So he comes over eventually and he starts to eat it. He gets about a quarter of a way halfway through the bowl and he starts to, I don't know, like act like he had to throw up. And it was very like a very violent kind of like experience. Like he was dry heaving, his whole body was kind of convulsing and it was very dramatic. And I was like, what in the world? And I knew that he didn't have anything stuck in his throat because he wasn't eating anything that would have gotten stuck in his throat. So I, they have a tendency when, when they get sick or they don't feel good or something hurts them, they want to hide. They want to like run and hide. I didn't want him to run from me because then I can't get him if he hides. There's certain places in their room, like they have a table they can get up under and I can get him out of there. But then I got to wrestle with him while he's trying to get sick and it's a whole thing. So I scooped him up and I put him in the cage and I locked the cage because I wanted to be able to watch him. So he continues this like violent trying to throw up thing. In the meantime, I had already tried to like, you know, rub his back and see if I could see what was going on. And I couldn't see anything. And all he wanted was to get down. So I put him in the cage and then he starts to try to throw up and he goes in the litter box. So he's in the litter box and he's throwing up. I actually have a short video of this and I will just share it briefly because I just want you to see what I saw. So here's that video. <laughs> Okay, so I'm really sorry. I had to refilm this part of the video, which is why I'm in two different outfits throughout uh, this one section. Anyway, so Weasel was getting really, really sick and I was didn't want to leave him alone, but I wasn't ready to take him to the vet because I thought, well, maybe this is just, he got an upset stomach or something really simple. So I put him with me in the baby stroller, like his ferret stroller, and I take him with me while I walk around the house and have other things to do. And he falls asleep and he's like, he's asleep and everything's fine. About an hour later, he wakes up doing the exact same thing. So he starts that whole like gagging, choking. It was really bad. So I take him out of his stroller and I put him back in the cage because I'm worried that he's got to go to the bathroom. And um, 
he just, this just continues. And I start to really get worried at this point. And if you don't know a lot about ferrets, and some of you may, some of you may not know, but they can go downhill really quickly. So for me, I don't ever, ever like to take the chance of I'll wait till tomorrow and see if he's better, especially in situations where they're acting like that. Um, for me, it's like he was, he could be dehydrated. He could just rapidly decline. And it was a Friday evening. So by now it's 930 at night on a Friday. Um, there are no vets. I live in the middle of nowhere. And I mean, I don't live far from like Baltimore, Maryland. I, I don't live in Maryland, but I don't live far from there. But there, and, and I don't live far from cities in Pennsylvania. But at 930 at night, there just isn't an, an exotic vet around. So I make some phone calls to all of the ER vets in our area and, and, and just to make sure they had an exotics vet on staff because it's no point in going to an ER vet if they can't treat your pet. Your pet. So I call one of the um, ER vets in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and they're like, yes, we have, a, we, have a, we have a vet on staff. She can treat exotics. She's here till midnight. So I get in the car and I rush him over there. That's already an hour from my house. So I get him there, they look at him, I tell him what I think is going on, like what's going on with him. They take him in the back, we're there for several hours. So by now it's like 12.30 at night, they have done an x-ray, they've put him on IV fluids, and she comes in and she's like, I'm pretty sure that he has a blockage, but it's really hard for me to be certain on an x-ray, which is not uncommon. It can be hard to tell on an x-ray if there's a blockage. But she says, but I can't treat him. So at this point, I'm a little irritated, but I'm more concerned about him than I have time to be irritated at the fact that they told me they could treat him and they couldn't. But that was not going to work for me because what am I going to do? Nothing. So I know for a fact that our vet in Maryland, who happens to be a 24-hour emergency vet as well, could treat him. So I told, I had the vet in Lancaster call down to my other vet. I had them send all the x-rays, the scans, the records. I They gave Weasel, um, they loaded him up with IV, like they gave him a bunch of fluids so he would be good and hydrated. We got in the car and at two o'clock in the morning, I drove him into Maryland. They obviously kept him overnight and um, I went home. So by now I've been up for 24 hours. It's 5.30 on Saturday morning by the time I got back home. And at that point I went to sleep and I just had to wait for the vet to call me. So their exotics vet didn't get on staff until 6 a.m. But um, they could at least keep him stable and monitor him until the vet arrived. I went home and I went to sleep at about 9 30 in the morning. The vet called and he said, you know, the truth, actually, that's not true. He actually called around 12. So in the afternoon. So he said, I, you know, I'm not really hundred percent sure if he has a blockage, but obviously something is really wrong. So, um, they did a bunch of blood work. His blood work wasn't crazy. It didn't come back. Like it was like anything was major wrong, but he just was just he was weak and he was just not he was not feeling well so the vet said you have three options you can do conservative treatment which is to let us monitor him and to you know just see what happens you can do a barium test which is basically where they take a dye and they put it into your ferret um, it, it goes through their system and they take x-rays every couple of hours and they can see if there's a blockage because they can follow the dye through the intestinal tract into the colon if the dye makes it through to the colon more than likely there's not a blockage. It's a pretty good indication that there's not a blockage. Or we could have just gone right into exploratory surgery. Well, I don't want to do exploratory surgery on him because the vet was not really 100% sure he had a blockage. This is my vet that I trust. This is the one that did his leg surgery. This is the vet that I had before I moved to Pennsylvania. Like, I trust this man. He's been treating ferrets for 30 years. He's really good at what he does. And I'm like, let's do the barium test. To me, it was a happy medium. So we did the barium test, which takes a couple of hours sometimes to complete. Um, they called me later that evening and told me that the barium had made it all the way through to his colon and that they were very certain that he did not have a blockage, which was excellent news to me because he did not have to then undergo surgery and no unnecessary cutting. However, the vet did believe that he had an overgrowth of H. pylori or Helicobacter pylori, which is a bacterial infection. So the thing about the Helicobacter is it can create like ulcers in their stomach. And, you know, all of that kind of can come out in the symptoms that Weasel had. Those symptoms also mimic several other diseases. If you see those symptoms in your ferret, know that it can be a couple of different things and that your vet's probably the best person to pinpoint it. Knowing that he could potentially have had this bacterial infection and that this bacterial infection is highly contagious, <laughs> I came home 
and I like tore apart the ferret room and cleaned everything. Um, I cleaned all the litter boxes. I cleaned all of their bedding. I, cl I literally scrubbed everything. And um, so what my plan is now is, so what my plan is now, so some of the other ferrets may not show symptoms. They could be carrying this and just really not have the same effect. It may not have the same effect on them as it has on weasel. However, if they're carrying it and obviously weasel's immune system is crap, then I only say that because he's the only one that ever gets sick. Like it's, cr it's just crazy. Um, so knowing that I just, I don't want him to get it again. So my plan is I will be taking the other poor ferrets to the vet for a checkup, even though it's not time for their annual checkup as a precaution. If there is even a slight possibility that they have, um, any kind of infections at all, I want to nip that in the butt now because I don't want them passing it back and forth to each other. And I certainly don't want Weasel to go through what he went through again. It was stressful on him. It was stressful on me and he's got a little tiny body and I don't want that for him. And in the meantime, um, Weasel is separated from them and it's not because I wanted him to be. The vet recommended that. Basically, the vet did not want them in his litter box. So if he is pooping and he's on antibiotics and he's pooping out any kind of infection or viral bacterial whatever, um, the other ferrets get in the litter box, they get it. Now, they've all been around each other. So truth be told, if he has it, they already have it anyway, potentially. So that's why I'm going to be taking them to the vet. So Weasel has been home for a while. He's been home almost a week. Um, I'm going to show you guys kind of clips of the day that I first brought him home and then now just to show you kind of a difference in how he is feeling. Um, he's still kind of tired and he does sleep a little more than normal, but he's getting better every day. Okay, so Weasel is on a Moxie Drops three times a day, every eight hours. He's got Caraphate. Uh, three times a day, every eight hours, and a Meprazol once a day. Good boy, your eyes don't look so good, buddy. Okay, here, come here. What are you doing this so happy for? Come here. He's so cute. He's so cute. <laughs> He's so cute. He's so what I do want to talk about is how expensive this was. And, I, and I'm only going to focus on this because it's important. Um, fortunately for me, I was in a position to pay this bill. But five years ago, I wouldn't have been. Um, and that's just the truth. And so it can get really costly. And I feel like it's important that people know that, that it take like exotic pets or pets that are considered exotic are often much more expensive to care for vet wise than your dog or your cat. It's just a specialty and they cost a lot. So at the first vet that I took him to, um, just for the x-rays and the fluids and all of that, the bill was $470. And then I went over to the next vet. And by the time I walked out of there today, the total there was $2,183.13. The Barian test by itself was $727.25. The office visit just to walk through the door was $133. The diagnosis health profile and all the, that was $330. So this whole shebang um, in total was $2,183.13 at the one vet and $470 at the other. So um, Weasel was alive and well. And some people may say, what on earth were you thinking to pay that? Let me just tell you something. Those ferrets are my life <laughs> and I would do anything for them. He is four years old. He had some sort of infection. I'm not, what are my options to do nothing? You know, it's really hard and it can be really expensive. It's also really emotional. I had the first vet tell me that he had a blockage and she couldn't care for him. I was a wreck. I just wanted to get him somewhere else as quickly as humanly possible. I didn't care if I didn't sleep for three days, if it meant that I got him to a bed. Um, I just feel like it's really important that like you guys know just how much goes into ferret care. And I would never ever want to discourage anybody from getting a ferret. Um, they are the funniest, coolest, just awesome little guys. They have made my life completely different than I ever saw it. Um, they are the reason that I have an Etsy shop. They are the reason that I get to work for myself. They are the, re you know, 
they have just brought so much to my life and they definitely give more to me than I probably ever give to them just because they're like, they just bring so much joy. You cannot be around them and not laugh or smile. Um, but you know, there are times where you're like, holy crap, how am I going to pay for this? You know, I just am fortunate that, that in this moment today, I was able to take care of that bill. You never know. There are times where I wouldn't have. Six months ago, maybe I wouldn't have. It just depends on the timing and the situation and all the other things that are going on in life. And I would love to tell you that I have a savings account right now for my ferrets, but I don't because I have um, a household and I have other things that have happened recently where I just don't have a whole lot of money in a savings account specifically for them. But I am fortunate enough to um, just have my Etsy shop. And then to be real, quite honest with you, uh, my prior job that I had basically asked me to come back and they, um, made it very worth my while to come back to work. So I went back to, I'm back at work part-time. Um, and I get to work from home, but it's just really important that you're able to care for them if you need to, or that you have a way to, that you know what you're going to do if you can't. Like, what is your steps going to be if you financially can't or aren't able to care for them? It's just overwhelming sometimes to think of the price. I have five ferrets. If one is sick and, you know, two or three get sick, God forbid, at one time, I mean, that could wipe me out. If I had three ferrets sick at one time and that was the bill, I would have spent $9,000 almost to care for them. Who has that kind of money? It's expensive. I have him and all of the other ferrets scheduled for a vet appointment next week. We have to go two separate days, so I'm taking them in two groups. Um, that's going to be, uh, let's see, it was another $360 just to reserve those appointments. But I don't really care because I just want to make sure that they're healthy. I'll take you guys with me so that you know what's going on. And I hope that this video was helpful. If you have any questions, just let me know. And thank you guys for all your support and your love. I really appreciate it. I will see you next time.